a new biology. The new biologists are really quite magnificent. My main interest has, in the last few years, centered around violence, and I, I've gotten kind of hipped on the subject. I'm disturbed over the violence in the, in the world as a whole, and it does not seem to be getting better, it seems to be getting worse. I've spent about four years working on a book that I doubt very much I will ever finish. I don't buy green bananas any longer. <laughs> and the, the, seriously, this, this, this book, as I said, I've worked on it about four years, and uh, I can't even get anybody to read it. Uh, it, it's on the biology of transcendence, and I've looked at the evolutionary process to show that it's a transcendent process right from the very beginning, that it all moves toward transcendence. If you look up the dictionary, it gives the definition of transcendence as the, the ability to rise and go beyond limitation. Isn't that neat? That's all it is. Very simple. And if you look into the biology of the hum <coughs> human brain, and where it came from, you'll find it's simply a series of rising and going beyond its own limitations. The uh, issue about uh, about uh, our violence is that we are thank thank you we're we're biologically designed for transcendence, and either that is developed in us or violence is the only possible alternative. That is, we're faced with transcendence or violence, and there's really no in between. And the more our transcendent structure within us uh, gets impaired, the more violent we become. And that's why I, I really support Waldorf education in every, at every chance I possibly can, because if there is one single force left in the world that could leave us out of violence, it's Waldorf education. And I must say I've had a lot of grandchildren in Waldorf school, and one, one daughter, I... I have a 49-year-old daughter and a 19-year-old daughter. Not many of you can brag about <laughs> that. Uh, I wanted to start off with the, with talking about <clears throat> the work of Paul McLean. Most people have heard me talk about Paul McLean for a long time. He was, for 40-some years, head of the whole... Uh, neuroscience at the National Institutes of Health, one of the biggest research uh, groups in the, in the world, and he's one of the great neuroscientists of all times. He was the first one to ever come up with the fact that these three divisions of our brain, what they originally called a hindbrain and a forebrain, hindbrain the old tip brain, and the forebrain being uh, the mixture of the old mammalian brain and the new mammalian brain, or our brain, human brain. And uh, he was the one who pointed out that these three different major areas of the brain are the whole evolution of brains since the beginning of, practically the beginning of life. That in, we embrace in our skull all development in brains throughout history. We've got them all there. And if you want to make, uh, understand what makes your neighbor so cantankerous, it's this old reptilian brain here. <laughs> uh, or what makes your boss, you know, such a uh, carnivore or something. That, that is the issue, is the old reptilian brain. Now, McLean spent 40-some years studying these brains for the kinds of behavior genetically encoded in them. And so it was on the brain and by the evolutionary uh, development of brain and behavior that he spent most of his life. And with that as, as a little uh, pre preview here, I want to get into what I consider the most exciting research, in the, certainly in the past 10 years and maybe in the past 50, that just came out in 1997-98, somewhere along there about the forebrain and the hindbrain. Now, let me mention again now that the forebrain are the two latest evolutionary additions of our brain. The old mammalian brain, what we call our emotional brain, and this one up on top called the neocortex of the new brain, or the, the human brain. And evolution has, has moved from the, this very primitive sensory motor structure of the reptilian brain adding more and more over really a total of several hundred million years and finally has given us this huge thing called 
the, the human brain. But it all rests on this very ancient sensory motor hindbrain. The hindbrain is the one that defends us. It's the one that's going to rear up and bite you if you come close to it and that sort of thing. And the forebrain is, of course, our reflective, intellectual, verbal, creative brain. So you've got this reflexive, fast, lightning fast, quick survival brain, defensive and touchy, that we call the, the hind brain, and this reflective, more intelligent, vastly more intelligent forebrain. Now with that, we get into some research that just came out a short time back. Any pregnant mammal, human or anything else, that is in a tense, anxiety-ridden, hostile, competitive environment will give birth to an infant with an enlarged hindbrain, a larger body, larger musculature, and a sharply reduced forebrain. Okay? Any mother who is in a safe, protective, loving, nurturing environment will give birth to an infant with an enlarged forebrain and a sharply reduced hindbrain. Okay? And a smaller body. Now, research shows, in fact, that if her conditions change in the middle of pregnancy from a hostile environment to a loving, nurturing one, the actual shape and change of the brain changes in utero accordingly. If she starts off with everything lovey-dovey and feeling that everything is okay and suddenly things very, very rocky, immediately a change takes place in the growth of that brain system. And it's the most Darwinian, sensible, practical thing nature could do. She tries to prepare the infant for what? The kind of environment that her mother is sensing that he's going to have to take his, his place in. Is that making sense? Yeah? But now let's, let's look at the part of the brain that is particularly involved in this, uh, is, is this intellectual forebrain here. Now, if a person is brought into the world with a reduced size forebrain and a great big hindbrain and a larger body, what, what are they going to be? Uh, they're going to be equipped for a hostile environment. And we find a strange thing in, in the studies in bioculturalism, such as, as uh, Antonio De Nicolas and Maria Calavita at the State University of New York have been working on for a long time, bioculture. The fact that our culture profoundly affects our biology and our biology profoundly affects our culture. They are dynamic back and forth. And so if you start getting a large number of mothers who are, who are undergoing a lot of tension and and who don't feel safe <laughs> and are worried about things in pregnancy, what's happening? They're going to be giving, she's going to be giving birth, of course, to two to children that uh, uh, are equipped for that kind of environment. And what will happen? Inevitably, they create the kind of environment they're equipped for. Now, the more that environment is created, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that they're used to, then what is going to happen? then the greater the overall level of the whole anxiety level and so on and so forth, and the level of that culture will increase. And as a result, that tendency will then grow and grow and grow. Is that making any sense? Um, it makes too much sense to me. I almost hurt, wish I'd never heard of all that. <laughs> now, this is an exciting time in history because we've learned more about the development of the brain and its behavior than any time in history, and even in the last 10 years. And it's, it's extraordinarily exciting to think of what we could really do for our children with all the knowledge we have. At the same time, things are happening which are serious, very serious, for the survival of the species itself. In 1975, the German professors at Turnbingen began to realize that the students they were working with weren't responding as students had in the past. 
and every year it became more and more severe. They simply were not able to comprehend, they weren't able to, retend, uh, to, uh, to re re uh, retain their information, and they were just, just different. And so the, with the German Psychological Institute, they set up a 20-year project interviewing something over 4,000 people every year. Uh, and these were young people, young adults, 18 to 20 is what I understand they were, very, not children, but young adults. And their findings, they published about 1975. What they found out, there was a 1% reduction of the overall sensory system's ability to bring in information from its environment per year. And they found a clear 20% difference in the sensory intake, the ability to bring in sensory information in the young people of 1995 than they had in 1975. And let me backtrack for a minute with the work of Marcia McCulloch. She got disturbed about what was happening to children and in the mid-1980s took a batch of the tests out of, out of Princeton and other places in their <laughs> child development, some of the Yale studies and all, for testing children's ability to respond to external information. That is just their environment right around them. Their sense of taste, touch, smell, feel, hearing, listening, remembering, responding, general cognition. And she went down to South America in some of the jungle areas and tested the jungle children. And then she went to Guatemala and tested some of these very, very, the lowest standards of living in the world, you know, the grass shacks and all that. And went to Africa and tested the children in many very preliterate African societies. Then she started testing both children in America and on over in Europe. She found that our children in America operated at 25 to 30 percent less ability to bring in sensory information and respond to it than did the children in these grass shacks and so forth and so on. Now, this is a great shock. We think, well, they, our children have had the highest standard of living and all these great advantages. Why should children from preliterate societies be miles ahead uh, in that? The average person uh, 20 years ago could distinguish over 300 different shades of a single color. You know, no matter how subtle it became, you could still recognize, well, red or a form of red and so on. This had reduced to 130 by 1995. Now, that's a, that's a very sharp uh, uh, cut back and the ability of the, of, of, of the eyes to see and so on and so forth. And the same thing happened with all the other senses, drastic reductions in the, in the sensitiveness to one's own direct environment. Some of their conclusions, for instance, was that these young people had to have such a high intensity of input to get past the reticular activating system of the brain. I'll show you a picture of one in a minute. That, that um, anything less than a high intense input of, of uh, sensory information simply wasn't registered. They said, for instance, put into a calm, pastoral, wood-like setting, let's say, or park-like setting, the average young people now got very nervous. They got anxiety-ridden uh, and fidgety. Why? Because their brain wasn't receiving enough sensory information really to keep it going. They were suffering sensory deprivation in anything like an ordinary setting. They went on. Now, there was this Dr. Harold Rao, I remember at uh, Tübingen uh, University, who, who said that because of the difference of the actual shape and nature and character of the brains of these people over a 20-year ch uh, 20 shift that really we were dealing with students whose brains bore very little relationship to what they had been 20 years ago. Now this is in Germany. So we can always breathe a sigh of relief and say, well, that's in Germany. <laughs> but the, the issue was that the brains were doing what? changing dramatically according to the nature of the environment. Now, when you get into the reticular formation, we could, we could give you a picture of it right quick, but it's in, the old brain, it's in the old brain system way down here, or let's just say the reptilian brain, that's in red, that's easy to see. 
And what it is is that we can call it the gateway that brings all the sensory information from the body and all the rest of the head and everything else and kind of synthesizes, brings it all together and sends it up for processing to the higher brain centers. What has happened is that dating mechanism has gotten higher and higher and higher every year, so it took more and more input of a heavier nature to register, to get past the gate as it went up. The threshold got higher. From what? Inappropriate stimuli from the first moment of birth on that did not match the stimuli needed for the two ancient brain structures called what? The reptilian brain and the old mammalian brain. <clears throat> and the reptilian brain, of course, being also the spinal cord and really the whole neural system of the body. That's really what the reptilian brain is. And that the information coming in was not appropriate for the development of these two ancient brains, our sensory motor and our emotional brain, on which the high intellectual brain could function, you see. Inappropriate information. And, and so what was happening? Well, these weren't developing appropriately at all, and because the, the, the stimuli given them was so, in, so unnatural and of such a far greater intensity than these two brain structures were designed to handle over a hundred so million years of development, information they just weren't able to handle at all. And so what happens? It says the brain simply breaks down in its adaptive ability and begins to, to, to grow and function according to try to survive in a totally unnatural situation. Now what's the next, next result of this is that the great intellectual creative brain up on top rests on and depends exclusively on the development of the two animal brains, as we call it. And so the two animal brains aren't developing appropriately at all because they're not receiving appropriate nurturing or, or stimuli, and as a result, the higher brain can't develop at all as it should, and both are maladapting to the kind of situation that children are exposed to. Now, this does have some relevance to what's happening uh, to us in this country. And I want to just mention that here because this is really a pretty, a pretty, serious, uh, pretty serious situation. Now, Alan Shore, his medical guy down at the uh, medical school at University of California in Los Angeles, and he spent 12 years on a single book. One of the most extraordinary single uh, episodes we've ever had in child development. Alan Shore, I just bow down and bay at the moon when you mention his name, a very great man. Uh, he spent this entire time on the period of development from the 11th month through the 18th month after birth. And he said that during that time that the shape of the brain was determined almost entirely by the emotional state of the mother-child relationship. Now, this follows on, or precedes, it came before the discovery that the brain developing in utero depends almost exclusively on what? The <laughs> nature and, and character of the mother's emotional state. Now, here we have the fact that the brain shapes according to the environment that the mother thinks she's in, in utero, and then after that, the shape of the brain is determined in its actual growth by the kind of, of emotional state set up between the mother and the infant. Now, that gets us up to the three different levels of the brain again, Now I have to add a fourth. Actually, the most exciting single thing, and the thing I'm going to be talking about quite a bit tonight, and some of you have heard me yak about this before, is that this, this um, high brain up here has from this point right here, you've got cerebral cortex here, and then you've got this area here right behind the eyes. It's the largest single section of the whole brain, which is called the prefrontal lobes. Now, the, the ma major part of these three brains the reptilian formed over hundreds of millions of years, very, very ancient, very powerful, very strong, sensory motor, survival, defensive brain. The old mammalian brain, many millions of years old, very strong, very powerful, 
brain for relating to, and then the new intellectual verbal brain that makes the human, the human situation. But then about 40,000 years ago, and, and, and we're not sure of that date, and there's a lot of, con of, of controversy about it, but a, it looks like about 40,000 years ago, nature added another one, and it's called the prefrontal lobes. And Shor found out that the majority of the prefrontal lobe doesn't develop in the utero. The actual cellular growth of this huge prefrontal lobe is determined by the emotional nurturing the child receives in the first year of life. And most children get most of their emotional nurturing in the first year of life. Then comes this critical thing of the prefrontal lobes, which is this part right up behind the eyes, and its connections with the old mammalian brain, which is our emotional brain. I think of, of Patricia Goldman Rakic, one of our really top-notch neuroscientists, saying the job of this, these prefrontal lobes seems to be to monitor, moderate, modulate, and actually govern the behavior of all the rest of the brain, including the majority of the neocortex, the new brain. The prefrontal seem to be the governor of the whole show. And when does that really grow? immediately after birth in, and, uh, in, in uh, coordination with, with the mother's emotional nurturing. And the more the nurturing, the more the prefrontal lobes, the more the ability to moderate and modulate the activity in all the rest of the brain. Follow me? Now, right bef uh, before the first year of life, before their first birthday, okay, before they're getting ready to wrap up on the hind legs and charge out to become the terrible two, there's a huge growth spurt, not only in the prefrontal lobes, but particularly in what they call the orbitofrontal loop, which is one of the most critical parts of our whole life. It's where this newest brain in evolutionary history, added only 40,000 years ago, brand new, and we've never really learned to use it yet, and its connections with the emotional brain that has to do with all of our capacity to relate to each other because the emotional brain is the one that handles all of our loves, hates, likes, dislikes, and ability to relate to each other, and to learn, remember, and all that. That's the old mammalian brain that we share with all mammals. And its connection with the prefrontal is it starts after the first year of life. Why does it have to wait until then? Because we've got to wait until the prefrontals have grown enough. This grows in utero. This grows after utero, the prefrontal lobes. And so now, there's this growth spurt where they connect together in this tremendously critical part, and it's determined almost exclusively by the treatment the child receives from its caretaker. We have to shift from mother here to caretaker for 80% of our children because they don't have really mothers. As they have caretakers now, as you know most of them do. Now, what Shore did... And he found that all of these are what he calls experience-dependent neural structures. By experience-depending, it means the kind of environment the child is in, that neural structure will be maintained or not. And he found that this great growth spurt that takes place in the 11th month, getting ready for that 12th month uh, change over from our crawling around on our belly and our mammalian over to the first real step into being a full human, getting up on their hind legs, that that growth spurt is almost completely deconstructed for the majority of children in the next six to seven months when they hit what's called socializing the child. Okay? Uh, what does it mean by socializing the child? Making him behave so that he won't embarrass us in society. That's all it is. Okay. Uh, and Shaw finds that in, in the average American household, this little child finally getting up on their hind legs to charge out and do what nature encodes within them as their strongest, their second strongest drive, which is to explore every single item in the world that they don't know, every new item, 
with their full sensory system and build what Piaget calls a structure of knowledge of it, that is the neural mapping in their brain of what that object is like, what it tastes like, touches like, feels like, hears, what it listens and so on, all the five senses interacting, or 12 senses if we really get into it, but we'll leave that out. And they're driven by millions of years of genetic encoding to explore everything around them, leaving nothing out with all their sensory system and build these structures of knowledge in the brain and then keep up this exploration to stabilize those structures, myelinate them, and so on and so forth. Every nine minutes, the average child receives a very strong, stringent, harsh inhibition of that behavior, as Shore calls it, which we refer to as no or don't every nine minutes around the clock. As the child does what? Starts to follow this overwhelming uh, natural encoding to explore the world and build a structure of knowledge of it. All mammal children do that. Uh, I, I, I'll skip for now the, the studies of Tinberg and his Nobel laureate group on how the child is driven to interact with these objects and checks out with the, the parent, whether we're talking about animals or humans, to see what the parent's reaction is to the object as they go to interact with it, okay? And then to build as, as part of the, the structure of knowledge of the object, their parent's emotional response to the object. That's what we call state-specific learning. So we find that the emotional state builds into that structure of knowledge ju uh, just like any other part of the, of the object itself. And here, every nine minutes, as they're, they're trying to explore their world, comes a harsh no or don't, and generally backed up with a swat, if you, if you, you know, to, to let them know we really mean it. Now, then Shore goes into a lot of research, a great deal of research, on the actual hormonal, neural, emotional response of the child to every time the, the mother or the caretaker that the child knows their life depends on totally, suddenly blocking them from doing the one thing they're driven by their, their natural encoding to do, to build a structure of knowledge of the world. Now, one single no or don't will take a child anywhere from four to five minutes for the system to recoup from it. The first thing that happens from that, when the, 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 the caretaker, who's the child's source of life itself, we hope it's his mother or his father or somebody, uh, when the caretaker prevents him from interacting with the world because he's driven by two, two forces, one to interact with the world, the other to maintain the bond with the mother at all cost. Why? And you find this in all mammal life. To maintain the bond with the mother is the big number one because that means what? Survival itself. What they call separation anxiety or psychological abandonment is the greatest single fear a child can experience, being cut off and separated from the source of his life, which is his mother. And you find exactly the same response in them, neurally, hormonally, emotionally, to no or don't as you do to separation anxiety that the child experiences. They react exactly the same way. Why? All of a sudden, the mother has threatened separation from her as the caretaker. If the child does what nature drives the child with their second greatest impulse to do. Am I making sense? So the child is split right down the middle in a tremendous amb ambiguity to, uh, by what? Two conflict drives. And uh, so we find that instead of building this structure of knowledge of the world, they're doing what? Constantly erecting a defense mechanism against a highly ambiguous world that they can't really quite figure out. Now let's look into to Shore's studies of the response of the whole brain system to harsh inhibitions of their behavior every nine minutes. Recall that the, the mother in a harsh environment gives birth to a child with a larger hindbrain and a smaller forebrain. You'll find that at every 
no or don't or inhibition of behavior of exploring the world that happens, there is a retreat of the child's energy and attention from their forebrain driving them to get out and do this highly uh, creative thing of, of building a structure of knowledge of the world from that into defense, which means they're moving from the forebrain to the hindbrain in all of their energy and attention each time. Does that make sense? Surely it should make sense to us. Now, I know you're immediately coming up with a million and one things. Look, I had five in my first family, and their mother died when they were all quite young, and I brought them up. So I've been through that stuff, and I know exactly the problem you face. Nevertheless, the issue is every prohibition of exploratory or what the psychologists call impulse behavior. Boy, you talk about a misnomer. Of trying to explore their world, every time that is met with a negative, they're caught in a tremendous double bind and go into a form of anxiety, withdrawal, and depression. And the child re body, from the signals coming in, releases cortisol into the brain. Cortisol is one of the adrenal corticoid substances released by the, by, by the adrenals, and it, its big job is to alert the body against danger. It's one of its biggest jobs. And here, cortisol is released. In effect, you're in danger why your, your caretaker or your mother is angry. And you find that this cortisol release is in response to her at every angry moment. Uh, now, let's just for one minute here, go on and look over a long period of time. Years ago, they discovered what we call state-specific learning. The emotional state you're in when the learning takes place builds into the neural structure of knowledge being created by that learning as an integral part of the learning. It isn't an emotional attitude tacked on. It is an integral part of the learning. If you learn your arithmetic to the tune of the hickory stick, the hickory stick is as much an integral part of your memory of that as any of the numbers involved. What they have found is this old reptilian brain that caused pain or fear or threat was involved in it, simply reacts, hormones are released, you go ahead and you try to make your intellectual structure of knowledge you're trying to do right, but you build into that structure of knowledge the hormone of fear or possible pain and so on and so forth so forth that is connected with that. From that point on, what they found, this is interesting, that any time then you try to recall, and this goes, takes place through the hippocampal area and through the amygdala and some very clear parts of this emotional brain as it meets with this old reptilian central motor brain. And if you learn the, the, your arithmetic to the tune of the hickory stick, and you try then to do what? Recall what you've learned the old reptilian defensive mode pulls you right out of your intellectual brain into your defensive mode again. Why? Hey, we got hurt by this kind of thing once. You better be careful. I remember in 1963, and some of you, I'm sure, have heard me talk about this, we had a, an educational conference that the uh, Carnegie Foundation put on. And they said at the first, we have discovered, they said, at the first sign of anxiety, all learning seems to, to stop. And they said, and it seems from our studies that American education is designed to produce maximum anxiety in the shortest period of time. <laughs> uh, now, this, this tells the tale. They were at that time talking about the fact that the average American student in school seems to retain only 3 to 5% of the total information they've been exposed to in the course of a year. That was the high high end of it. Some of them don't make that. Now, why? Why? Why is there such a low level of retention? Well, since then we've discovered state-specific learning, and we know the brain never forgets anything. But it won't go near it <laughs> if what? <laughs> if it got clobbered when it was learning it. Very simple. Now, from that, what, what immediate thing occurs to you? Uh, what about the retention level of our children? 
Well, they, they're retaining everything. Why won't they go back and pick it up? One part of their brain is fighting another part. There's no coherence. There's no entrainment of the three parts. We're thinking one thing, feeling something else, and acting in a totally different way. Why? Why is there no entrainment? Well, because in the, at the time of that learning, here's the intellectual brain saying, oh boy, I really want to learn, I really want to do right, etc. And the emotional brain, where all learning takes place, is being threatened, and the old sensory motor brain is recoiling. So you've got three different things. We're a house divided against ourselves, even as learning takes place. And, and the, the em negative emotion is locked in as permanent a part of the learning as anything else. So what would be the, what would be the first great absolute that you would have to have for an educational system? The one thing that could never be violated if you really meant it, if you didn't just want to punish children, what would be the one thing you would insist on? That that child feel absolutely safe, wanted, loved, unconditionally accepted every single moment of the day. Which means that the minute you have to talk about discipline, you've already lost the game. The word discipline, by the way, comes from the word disciple, which meant originally joyful follower. And if you look at, at, at an undamaged two or three year old, they're the most joyful followers in the world. They won't do everything right. The terrible, too, is an artificial construct of culture. It is not a natural thing at all. Uh, your first, first requirement, the first commandment of any educational system is the child must be given a safe ambient. He must be given, she must be given the safe space for that learning to take place in. Without that, you're licked. From the beginning, nothing real is going to happen. When we get into the issue of testing, try throwing an EEG, an electroencephalograph, on your child and an electrocardiogram to check out what the heart and the brain are doing when you say, now you're going to be tested. What does this mean? It means you're going to be found, you're going to be weighed to see if you're found wanting. And when do we start this? We start in four-year-olds in half the states in this country, testing children to see about their, their reading readiness, whether they should have remedial work before we send them to pre-kindergarten. Uh, so look at your standards of learning now that have been coming out. And what have the teachers been saying about them? They're wrecking things but it's become a political football. So, testing. Testing, and no safe space for the learning. And then what do we do? Then we condemn them for not following our directives. It, it just doesn't work. It isn't working. It never has worked. And that's why I passionately <laughs> support Waldorf education. At any rate, the, the other point here about these different parts of the brain that represent different evolutionary periods, as you know, the stages of development are, are very famous right now, um, have been for a long time. Rudolf Steiner was the first one to come up with the stages of development. Maria Montessori, a medical doctor, a, a, a child, child doctor, pediatrician, working with, uh, with uh, very deprived children from the slums of Naples, and began to establish homes for children. She never would call them schools. She never liked the word school being used in relation. These were homes for children in which the child would be loved unconditionally, protected, and so forth, and that their real innate learning would just simply unfold, and it did. She, she said, we never teach children anything. We just simply provide the appropriate environment, and they teach themselves. But she came up again with these, these uh, stages of development. Then Jean Piaget, a Swiss biologist, actually 
Maria was his mentor. He learned nearly everything from her and spent 60 years studying these stages of development. I'm going to sketch them very briefly. We have three stages of development in utero, of course. They're the development of these three major parts of the brain. Then at birth, and then one, four, seven, and these are very loose. I mean, this is debatable all the way around, but we'll, we'll go for the big, great big ones. Fifteen. 11 and 15, there's a big one at age 9, as, as Steiner points out, very critical. But let's go by these sort of four-year uh, cycles here, and they're, they're big six-year cycles that you can, you can come across, and there's seven-year cycles, the first seven years, the next seven years, and so on. But these, at these particular times, you have brain growth spurts, the brain undergoes a huge growth spurt at, at birth at 1, 4, and 7, and the seven-year-old child has a, a brain with about six, to 700% more neural mass than you and I have as adults. They lose most of it, 11, because use it or lose it is nature's dicta. Well, now that's not the only reason that it's cut back at 11, but it's one of, one of the big reasons. Now, uh, the, the um, thing about these developmental stages, they represent very clearly the, d the development of the encodings or the predispositions, the blueprints for behavior and action built into these major parts of the brain and the way they all unfold at these different times when your little infant's crawling around on its belly and suddenly it's up uh, off its belly on four four legs begin to get a little up of the mammalian going and then when it finally rears up on its hind legs here around age one it's fully into the mammalian period and beginning to touch into this high human area and then at age four he's moving on up and fully into the right hemisphere and this sounds very mechanical uh, and then at age seven, fully into the left hemisphere. And of course, these are, these are, it represents the behaviors and the capacities, the abilities, uh, and the kinds of intelligence that the, each of these brain structures developed over millions of years offers for development. Now, at each one of these stages, each one of these points, nature is asking again the same question she asked in utero, can we go for more intelligence or do we have to defend ourselves again? Because that's what all of the evolution has been about. Can we go for more intelligence or do we have to defend ourselves again? Can we move on up for greater and greater intellectual brain up here or must we strengthen this sensory motor reptilian defensive system? Uh, and we find that happening at age one. Shore's work shows it very brilliantly. And we find it happening at age four and at age seven. At each of these periods, nature's facing the same decision. Can we go for more intelligence, or do we still have to defend ourselves? I don't know whether you really believe that or not, but if you ever really begin to believe it, <laughs> yeah, it'll change the way you look at the whole situation of children in this world and in our country. So these decisions... Once they hit school, what should this decision be? Even if they've received a very bad, a bad uh, upbringing and have had a hard time and are having to constantly move into their defensive mode, nevertheless, this is almost like birth into a new world. And if they, were, if they felt totally loved, accepted, unconditionally wanted, that that was where they should be and they were happy with it, what would happen? then nature could go ahead. We've got a huge growth spurt right at that time. What could that growth spurt be for? It could be for greater intellect. And when our children are not nurtured and are not cared for and find it a very harsh world, they're putting all their energy and growth into the defensive brain. They have to. They have no choice in it whatsoever. That's what nature is doing. And this is a reflexive brain. It is not a reflective brain. It's a defensive brain. It is not a highly intellectual, intelligent brain. So there's, there's the situation with the, with the growth of daycare. And I know this is a painful subject. It should be. Uh, but with the growth of daycare, this situation has just exacerbated terribly. The people at Rudolf Steiner College out in Fair Oaks, California, have opened up a big project to, to look at the ways they can set up a, a daycare in the first three years that could actually, truly nurture 
and give the child the type of stimuli they need. And this is, this is very serious business. Uh, we're stuck with daycare, then we better try to make the best of it rather than just another economic uh, venture out of it. Now, this, these stages of development matching these periods of the brain's opening up and ready to develop, Alan Shore points up something that, that Antonio Damasio, another one of our great neuroscientists, points up, that not only does each of these modules of the brain hold within it a certain block of intelligences and capacities, but each depends critically on the establishment of the preceding one. That is, there's just no way you can get an emotional brain going if you don't have a sensory motor system that's functional. 